Evening guys, how are you all doing tonight? A little bit of a change of location to where I knew, normally shoot my videos in the, the grow tent or outside in, in the garden and the reason for that is I've been wanting to put together a video for a while now on something a little bit different I've been trying and that's messing with trying out mushroom spores. So. I've had it in my mind for a little while. It's not something that I've ever done before or I'm particularly knowledgeable or good, or good at. Um, but I've always wanted to kind of get some fruity mushrooms into the garden and into the yard. And so I thought what I'd do is work out how to propagate mushrooms and what's needed to do that. And it's, it's quite a steep learning curve, especially if you want to kind of start from scratch and, and go from nothing to having mushrooms kind of uh, spores growing and then uh, putting them in the in the correct kind of medium for them to fruit and all the things that are required to make that happen but I thought I'd give it a go and in particular as always I'm kind of going straight to the extreme my uh, my mushroom of choice my kind of goal and target is to get morel mushrooms to fruit and I say it's going to the top because I'm kind of starting at the most difficult kind of Top of it, top level is because morel mushrooms are very hard to cultivate in kind of captivity. Morel mushrooms grow in the wild, they have um, associations with particular trees, they're very, very well, not very, they're quite common in Europe and America, and they associate with trees like elms and poplars and oaks and apple trees and all sorts of things like that. In Australia it seems that we have a different type of morel mushroom which is a, a local type of morel and it seems to not be associated from my understanding with any of these uh, particular trees that are quite common in the US and throughout Europe etc. And these kind of morels um, often pop up in Australian native forests after fires. Um, there's a West Australian strain then there's um, other strains that kind of pop up but they, they tend to, to come up after fires and there's a lot of ash on the ground, a lot of nutrients, a lot of kind of alkaline soils and so I spent a lot of time earlier in the year searching for morels because they do exist in Canberra and surrounds and they're often associated as well in Australia with kind of granite beds like large granite boulders um, and kind of that sort of location and I, and I searched and I searched there are, there are spring mushrooms and I couldn't find any. If you go online, you can have a look at um, these websites that will kind of detail mushroom sightings. And you can see where the mushrooms are found and then you can hopefully go out there and find the same mushrooms in the same locations. But mushroom pickers are notoriously secretive and they don't put down their specific locations and they don't want to share them with you and, and all these sorts of things. So what I thought I would do is I would find myself some host trees that are common in the US. I would get myself some morel spore, some, some morel liquid with spawn that's kind of uh, in this liquid and I would create my own morel substrate, my, this morel uh, grow bag, I don't know what we even call it in the, in the mushroom world. And then I would use that and separate it out and put it under some trees that are kind of common hosts in the US and hope that it will eventually kind of turn into morel mushrooms. It's ambitious to be sure. But because I never do anything in, in halves, I went out and bought all the gear that I need to do this. I bought a large pressure cooker, I bought spawn bags, I bought grains to do this, I bought different varieties of kind of mushroom spawns and, and I have put it all together and it's taken weeks and weeks and weeks to do this and eventually over time some of these bags have started to produce. So let's start with um, how this actually works. So you get the morel, you get any of the kind of fungus spores in a syringe and the syringe has a liquid kind of a nutrient solution in there and the guys that make sure that it's the right varieties and all that sort of thing. Make sure that the syringe is full of the, the strain that you're looking for. And you need something for that kind of uh, spawn to grow upon. And, and often, and what they most often do, is they use a grain. 
and they come in these bags and I'm sure if you've done this before you know exactly about these these bags and you know what they are but I had no idea I'm learning as I go along and, and these bags you can purchase already sterilized you can purchase them with these kind of grains in them I have an injection port on each of the bag and you can see where I injected it through it's a self-healing injection port and you inject your liquid spawn into the mushroom into the bag sorry and then it starts to get colonized so you can see all the top of this bag has been colonized by the morel mushroom spawn now getting it actually colonized isn't the tricky bit because you can we can colonize things quite easily as you see here i've got half a bag of colonized morel the tricky bit is getting it to fruit and it's never no fruit at least a morel will never fruit in a bag like this it has to kind of go outdoors you can't fruit a morel indoors or at least not without a lot of difficulty and a lot of kind of trade secrets that are out there and so I have created a few of these bags and what my goal is to find some trees that are commonly associated like an apple tree, the elm tree, they've got some tulip poplars out there, I've got some oak trees and I will mix up these bags and then I will distribute them or crumble them up and put them around the base of these trees and maybe in a few years we'll get them somewhere else popping up. At the same time as the morels I've got some different varieties so I've got some easier varieties out there and this is one of them. This is a wine cap mushroom. It's called, also known as a King Strophoria. Uh, it is a mushroom that grows in kind of hardwood substrates. So you can, um, this, this bag is, is fully colonized by the way you can see. And in fact, it might be more than fully colonized because some of the parts of the bag is starting to get these black marks showing up. And I don't know if that's a contamination from a mold or something similar or if that's just how the wine cap mushroom goes. I've also noticed in the top of the bag there's a little bit of liquid starting to form. I don't know if that's going to pop up on the camera, but it concerns me. And because this bag is now fully colonized, of what I'm going to do in the next couple of days, and that's why this is spurred this video tonight, and what's kind of made me get on here and get this done, is I'm going to break that bag up and get some hardwood chips, and I'm going to start spreading it around the yard so that Hopefully in the spring, provided it's not too cold, I don't know if there's temperature tolerances for this, um, it will start to grow some wine cap mushrooms. And a wine cap mushroom is similar to, say, a you know, horse mushroom or a large field mushroom or something like that, which you can cook and fry up and it's meant to be quite a meaty, delicious mushroom. The other reason that I am a big fan of mushrooms in general is that fungus in general form symbiotic relationships with a number of plants and they help that they help plants transfer nutrients from the ground and from bacteria and other things to kind of help the plants grow. And I think it's a really positive thing to have these kind of associations forming in your garden and especially since I have a block of land hopefully that will be finished soon and I'll be able to kind of put these mushrooms in the yard and it'll be really nice for all this mycelium to be going through the soil. They'll be helping each other out. And if we get some edible mushrooms out of it, that'd be really great as well. Now, the media that I have here, these, these particular bags, you can buy these bags ready-made. You can go onto eBay or there's some sites on the internet. My water's just turning on, so we lost some light there. You can go on the internet and you can order these bags pre-made. You can get the, the, the sterile kind of liquid spawn straight off the internet as well. You can whack it in these bags and you can get ready to go. I also went, as I mentioned before, the more adventurous route where I made my own grain spawn bags. So I went and got some fresh grains and then I cooked the grains and dried the grains and pressure cooked the grains to make sure there's no contaminates and put them in a bag and sealed the bag and all that sort of thing. And they're actually down here. And I wanted to show you the process of some of these homemade bags. This is another morel bag. And this morel bag, you can see, it's a, it's a couple of weeks later, a couple of weeks uh, earlier than those other bags. So it hasn't quite colonized to the same extent. I have put a bunch of things in here. I've got um, some of these kind of smaller seeds. We've got some oats in here. We've got some wood shavings in there as well, just to kind of help these uh, colonize as best as I can. And so, this is this has started to colonize it doesn't look like it's infected and it is quite cold in the drawer where these are being stored so 
It, it could be a temperature thing that's not helping them colonise particularly fast. This is another morel bag. And I guess when you do your own bags, it's quite cheap to buy the bags in bulk. It's cheap to buy grain in bulk. And once you've got the equipment to sterilise and pressure cook and all that sort of thing, it is very cheap to make six to eight of these bags at any one time and then get a couple of liquid syringe cultures which don't cost all that much about 15 bucks 20 bucks and then just inject them all and then you can break these bags up as many times as you like and put them anywhere to kind of increase your chances of inoculating your yard we have an oyster mushroom bag now this one's another one that i made up it's another one of the kind of wood shaving and millet seeds and oat seeds you can see this one is colonising a lot more. In fact, it's nearly colonised the entire way through. Now, oyster mushrooms are meant to be a more beginner-friendly mushroom. Um, they, you've seen the oyster mushrooms, I'm sure, in the shops where um, they grow the sides of buckets and things like that. And it's just a, an interesting, this is a pink oyster mushroom, so it looks quite cool. This is another oyster mushroom in one of the bags that I pre-purchased. So instead of me making the grain up in this bag, um, this, this bag can pre-sterilise, ready to go. And if we compare them, so these were inoculated at the exact same time, to kind of get an idea about how the colonisation goes from my bags to the ones you purchase, you can see that, if anything, mine might actually be slightly more colonised than the purchased bag which is good to see it means I might have sort of done something right and getting it all done. You can hear my email going off there's no rest for a wicked real estate agents in Canberra unfortunately. This is another wine cap mushroom that I did. Now this came in at the same time as the morels in the, in the home bags and the, as the oyster mushrooms but this one doesn't seem to have colonized at all. It doesn't seem to be infected with anything, it just seems to be in the sun colonization on the back there. But it doesn't particularly seem to have done much at all in that time. We have another pre-purchased bag, so this is the pre-sterilized bag. This is a shiitake mushroom. And this one actually looks like it's almost fully colonized. Now, I don't actually know what to do with the shiitake mushroom after it's fully colonised. I don't know where to, to put it to kind of get it to fruit. I think it goes in like a wood stump or something along those lines. But this is getting close enough that I'm going to have to start doing some research to see what do I do with the shiitake mushroom uh, grain bag once it's all fully spawned. Another morel bag. This one has partially colonised. Last bag, this is another shiitake mushroom. This is one of my home bags again. And this one hasn't colonized anywhere near to the same extent as that other shiitake we looked at, um, which is just curious. I think it goes to show how much that's the exact same grain bag, they're all done in the same sterilization mix. Bags are all still sealed exactly the same. And uh, they're just so different in the way that they form. Maybe I put an extra few mils of the solution in here when I injected it through those injection ports. I don't know. But these, so this is my current mushroom project that I've got going on. Um, it's something that I am excited about and I will kind of follow up over the next few months. When I did these grain bags, I put together, I kind of filmed the whole process of the soaking the grains, boiling the grains, putting them in the pressure cooker, all that sort of stuff. And in the end, I kind of decided, well, actually pretty boring. In the future, if they work out and people have an interest, I might cut those kind of videos together and put that up to see if you guys want to watch that or not. Um, a couple of other updates while we're here as well. I've got a new, not a new, I have a grow tent that I've just put in the corner here. It's because I've run out of room in the large grow tent for some additional feet cuttings. So this tent here in the moment has around nine or ten different cuttings and I did a large spreadsheet just yesterday of all the feed cuttings that I have and it appears that I have somewhere in the region of 50 to 60 different feed varieties 
That's a lot of fig varieties, guys. That's, I don't know, it's got to be one of the larger fig collections around, at least in Australia, I'd imagine. And a lot of them are brand new cuttings as of this year. Uh, but I will hopefully be kind of putting out a lot of content regarding the fig cuttings this year. I would like to see a bunch of them fruit. I'd like to do some more taste testings. It's hard to do a proper taste testing in the first year of a fig cutting because they're often not very good while they're young trees and they kind of come into themselves as they get a little bit older. But it's something that I'm looking forward to doing anyway. Um, we can see how they change from year to year. We can see how the different plants grow from cuttings, which plants are more vigorous, which plants are less vigorous. I also want to do a video shortly about the cuttings that didn't make it. So as I showed in one of the videos months and months ago, um, I have a specific way. These emails just don't stop, guys. These emails, I tell you what. It's no rest all night, all day. It's emails up there. Yeah, that's a different story. The fig cuttings that didn't make it. So I showed the video of the fig cuttings and the method that I use to root fig cuttings. And I believe it's very, very successful. However, out of the 30, 35, 40 odd cuttings that have taken this season, this winter and autumn, there has been around four to five that have failed. So there is a small percentage that won't work for whatever reason. Although I will say that some of them did actually root and leaf without any problem at all and then failed at the transplant stage. So we'll talk about that in a different video as well. But all of these things that I'm kind of looking forward to doing and I know that I already kind of bombard you all with different videos but it's something that I do really really enjoy and I do find a lot of enjoyment in this. There's uh, other things that I want to do coming into the winter this year. I've got some uh, hascap berries, so some honey berries uh, that I really want to fruit. You know, they need a period of cold stratification. If there's anything camber, it's good for it's cold. So I want to put some outside. And I also have a substance, a stuff, a chemical. I don't know where I put it at the moment. It's called gibberellic acid. And way back in the day, and I'm talking 2004, when I was still very young and green and fresh, I actually went straight from high school into a horticulture degree. And during horticulture degree, I remember very, very clearly in one of our kind of plant biology lessons, I brought out this stuff, it was called gibberellic acid. And it was a, it's a stuff that makes plants grow. And essentially what it does in, in medium to large doses, it increases the, uh, the internodal distance between plants. So if you imagine you've got a tomato plant, and you've got a leaf here and a leaf here, these diff this kind of space is the internodal difference with a node and a node and, and this space. Now the gibberic acid might mean that normally the, the plant will have node spacing of this, but when you add the acid, the node spacing spreads out to like this. And so what it does to those plants is it makes them leggy and it kind of makes them grow larger. <coughs> it's not necessarily a great thing for the plants but it's also growth stimulating in other ways. And it can do things like help the hascap berries seeds that need a period of cold stratification to break dormancy without that. So I'm thinking about doing one where we go outside and we put it in the garden for a, um, to see if we can naturally cold stratify it. Maybe we'll put a bunch in the freezer to see if we can manually cold stratify it. And then maybe we'll test a third group with some of this gibberellic acid and see if that makes a difference. I also got a couple of different other kind of growth hormones uh, that we can test out. Um, I've had these now for months and months and months. And in fact, I've intended to do some freezer trials and uh, gibberellic acid trials. And I just never got around to it. I've just been so, so busy. Um, usually with these videos, I just tend to just chuck them up and uh, go in the tent, film my, my six to eight minutes and, and be done with it. Maybe every now and again a bit of a larger video, but there are things coming up and in the middle of winter I get a little bit uh, stir crazy, just kind of waiting and waiting for the warmth to come back on. And it's been kind of horrible out there in the last few days. We've had winds non-stop and it's just been chilly and horrible and gross. So I'm really looking forward to kind of the spring season. I want my cuttings to go. I want to be able to pull those tropicals out of the tent and hopefully get them to kind of fruit outdoors. I want to see the cherimoyas pop. I've got all these things that I want to happen and I'm feeling just confined by the winter at the moment. 
Anyway guys, this has been a long video. We'll follow up with these different mushrooms over the next uh, months and months and months. This is not going to be a, a short term project where I, I come along in two weeks and suddenly have mushrooms. I think it takes a bit more than that. But um, I hope that you have an interest in that and if there's anything else that um, comes across my mind in this time, I'll let you know. And otherwise, it's good to see you again and we'll see you in the next one. Catch you later.